Welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy Show, a Baxter Professional Services production. Welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy Show, where we're experts in nursing and experts in business. The Nurse Shark Academy Show highlights nurse business owners and others in the healthcare field who promote entrepreneurship. We interview nurse leaders and encourage them to tell their story. Today's guest is Sandra Boyd. And today's episode, how one nurse who's caring for a family member with a TBI as inspiration to help others. Nurses, are you burnt out, frustrated, looking for something new? Are you looking for more? Nurses, are you ready to feel the sun? You will dream big and expand your consciousness as an entrepreneur. Your nursing license is your key to freedom. Join the Nurse Shark Academy at the nursesharkacademy.biz today. Hi, and welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy show. I'm Tina Baxter, your host. The Nurse Shark Academy show highlights nurse business owners and others in the healthcare field who promote entrepreneurship. We interview nurse leaders and encourage them to tell their story. My mission is for you to own your seat at the table of nurse entrepreneurship, gaining confidence, skills, and freedom to live your life on your own terms. You will dream big and expand your consciousness as an entrepreneur. Join us and support these wonderful nurse entrepreneurs and leaders. Today's guest is Sandra Boyd. Sandra is the owner of Caregivers Haven LLC in Riverside, California. Uh, Sandra is uh, the leader and founder of Caregivers Haven, uh, Haven, excuse me, and has devoted most of her adult life to reaching out to others being challenged with the responsibility of providing care for those with a brain illness diagnosis. She shares her lived experience by providing education, resources, and support and coaching for other family caregivers who are stressed scared or exhausted and don't know where to go for help. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. So tell me, I always ask our first question is, what made you become a nurse? Uh, (laughs) I don't know. So my mom told me that I used to say I want to be a nurse. I'm a little girl. And So it's really weird because none of my relatives were nurses. No one had been in the hospital, like all the usual things that kind of prompt people to become, want to become a nurse. She just said that I always was always helpful. I always liked people, love people. And I said, I want to be a nurse. I know at some point it changed to where I wanted to be a pediatrician and then flip back to nursing. Um, But I've always loved people, always loved children. And it just came from where we don't know. It just, it never changed. You know, I I got, when I got in college, I just still wanted to be a nurse. So where did you go to school? Um, (laughs) I went, it's a long story, uh, because I went to several schools. I graduated from LA County USC School of Nursing. And and back when I graduated in 1982, it was still a old school diploma program where I lived at the hospital on campus in the nursing dorms. (laughs) You know, they don't they don't really have those anymore. I, and I think when I went there, ours ours at the time was one of the last three in the U.S. that were set up like that. But that's where I graduated with my RN. Um, and then I graduated with my BSN from California Baptist University. So that had to be a great experience because we don't have those experiences any longer where you sort of live on campus and you're there um, as pretty much, I don't know how to put it, but um, indentured servitude. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Where you're there for seven, you know, you're available to them. So they don't have to worry about staffing because they have all all of you there. So yeah, no, I I loved it. I tell people all the time, I would I would not change that experience for anything. Because back then, it's still like a that that hospital is still like a little city. I don't know. Did you ever used to watch uh, General Hospital? the soap opera so you know the big white hospital that they show at the beginning that's um that's la county used to be los angeles general general hospital but it's la county and um it was like a little city so it was like the big giant hospital was in the middle and then surrounding it were smaller hospitals so if you came down the back steps was the nursing dorm and then right across the street from that was like an eight floor psychiatric hospital and then across the street from that was a eight floor pediatric hospital. And then next to that was a four floor women's hospital. And in each hospital had their own emergency room. So like if you had a child that came to the ER, it was specific to pediatric patients that 
you know, that ER because it was a hospital. And even though I'm saying across the street, it wasn't like across the street. It was like, you know, a couple of steps <laughs> from each other. So yes. just this big giant hospital in the building and then these hospitals surrounding it. It was it was awesome. I swear you could like open your book and find any disease process if you went up there. You know, you get there was because people would come from all over to specialists. And so, yeah, it was it was a great experience. Yeah, and I, I sometimes kind of miss that because you had all that hands-on experience that, you know, I know we've moved towards a more academic model uh, with the, you know, entering the universities and things like that. But I miss that piece of spending that time actually doing the thing and being around seasoned nurses and learning from them. Yeah. And so I think we've kind of lost a little bit of that when we switch to putting everything into the university and really focusing on those. So I'm seeing that there's a shift now kind of back to introducing some of that into nursing and the training. So I, I'm encouraged by that. Yeah. So what did you decide to go back and get your bachelor's degree? You said when? What? What made you decide to oh, do that? Mm -hmm. Only because I... Uh, let's see how much of my personal life should I? <laughs> so I, I got a full ride scholarship out of high school to go to nursing school at San Francisco State University. And then about, I guess a year later, I left, I left my scholarship and followed a boyfriend to another university. <laughs> um, and so then when I came back, that's when I enrolled at LA County. So, you know, my mom's still mad at me 40 something years later that I did that. <laughs> On the other hand, my boyfriend became my husband, and, and in two months, we'll celebrate our 40th year of being married. So maybe it wasn't so bad, <laughs> you know. And you still, you still got to get your bachelor's degree. You still became a nurse. Yeah. Yeah. So I, so because I always tell my kids to finish what you started, um, because, because when, I, when I came back and went to L.A. County, of course, I only had my diploma. I didn't have my bachelor's because I left San Francisco State. So I went back way later. Um, and, it, and that was the only reason I did it just for me and for my kids, because I've always told them to finish what you start. And, and my boss, she was even like, because I was, I was 57, I think, when I went back. She was like, what are you doing? She goes, if you're doing this for me, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you're do, you're doing fine with what I need you to do, and I said no, it's for me, it's for me and my kids because I told them I always told them to finish what you started. So I'm just going to finish what I started many years ago. So where did you start working when you became a nurse? What was your first nursing job? My first nursing job was at LA County in the pediatric intensive care, and. Um, it, it was it was interesting because I really pissed off one of the other nurse managers because I had gotten hired into the neonatal ICU because the I think it was my whole second year of nursing school I worked night shift as a student nurse in the um, in the neonatal ICU and like back then it was like you for real worked it was it wasn't like you know you were just there doing secretarial work like I actually had patients I had babies um, and so because I had done that for a year and knew the manager and all that, um, I had been hired into there. And at the very T-90 last minute, I changed my mind and went to P's ICU only because um, one of my instructors told me that because, so our, our class was the first class that they were allowing to even go into specialties because everyone else, like when you graduated, you had to do a minimum of six months in med surge. And so she she just told me that she felt like Nikki was just like too specialized and so she said if you you know if you want to do peas or kids do pediatric ICU um it's still a specialty but it's not as specialized as NICU so the first two years I did pediatric ICU did you ever make your way back to the NICU yeah two uh so I did the two years there at LA County and then we moved and um it just so happened when we moved uh, out here to Riverside, they only had opening in the NICU. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was like, you know, I guess, you know, just it just kind of went in full circle, you know, and so I was back in the, in the NICU. And that's what I did the rest of my career. I, I did a little I did a couple of stints. Um, I did actually legal nurse consulting for one year. I know that's what you do. And it was way back in like 1990 when it was just kind of getting more popular and then i did pediatric home care for a while 
but other than that, I did um, neonatal ICU for um, you know thirty plus years, and then um, I ended my career, which in in an area which I thought was going to be a little less stressful. My sister was like, "You you've been doing you've been in a stressful jobs your whole career. Do you need to do something else?" So I went to um, um, informatics nursing. So I worked in the IT department, and it turned out that. <laughs> it was probably more stressful um, than ICU, like, but just in a different way, you know, in a different way. But it was very stressful. I was on the downtime committee. So when the whole system went down in the hospital, I was in charge to gather a team to get it. It was it was stressful. At first, it was fun because it was completely new and different. But then it was like, oh, my God, this is just as stressful. <laughs> And of course, at that time, that's when electronic medical records were first starting to come in. Because I remember being on the team um, at the hospital I worked when it was St. John's. And they introduced a uh, electronic medical record called Piggy. I <laughs> don't know what it stood for, but it was called Piggy. And when we we're sitting up there and I'm on the team to help implement Piggy and all this stuff. And they're like, yeah. So we went and bought this software that was like about eight years old. And we got um, the hardware that's like 10 years old because we know it's going to work. And I'm like, so wait a minute. You just bought outdated equipment, <laughs> and outdated software because it was just that new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just that new. And since then, I've helped three systems with their informatics. I've been on, on the committees to just sort of happen. When I was a staff mm -hmm. educator, so I, obviously I had to learn, right? Mm -hmm. and then the last time it was uh, I, because I was familiar with the system. Um, I was like, well, I can help you all implement that because I used to work in that system before. So I volunteered to be uh, one of their uh, content experts or whatever they call them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's it was interesting how far we've come in informatics because for a while that wasn't even a specialty for nursing. Right, right. Yeah, and, and I I remember having doctors and nurses quit or retire over electronic medical records. <laughs> oh yes, that happened with us. We had several of those. And, and now today everything is on electronic medical records. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. So what brought you then from doing that to starting your own business? So, um, so like I said, my sister was like, you, you know, when you get out of school, you need to find something else to do because you've been out in stressful situations all the, all this time. And I was like, well, what else am I going to do? I've only wanted to be a nurse. Like, I mean, I love being, I, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm sick of it already, but I love being a nurse. I still love being a nurse. Um, you know, before I, before I retired from the hospital, I would still like get teary eyed and goosebumps when I would, you know, when, when I was in deliveries, you know, seeing the babies being born and it would be like, you've seen umpteen of these. Why are you still getting so emotional? But it just, it's, it's a miracle to me. Um, I love it. I still love being a nurse. And so when she said that, I was like, I don't know what else I would do. And so she said, um, okay you you're gonna find something else to do she said you're a great teacher why don't you do something in teaching or whatever so my the end of the my last class when i was doing my capstone project my teacher talked me into <laughs> she talked me into going to speak at this conference and she also talked me into speak talking to our um, our C-suite about making some changes on our informatics team. And I didn't want to do either one. I was like, this was an assignment. I did it. I got my grade. I'm done. And she was <laughs> like, no, you should, you know, I want you, you know, I want you to try these other two things. And so I did. And um, so when we went to the C-suite, we, I was at, I did a, um, a big uh, chart and we were able to actually change our team to, to this chart that I did for my project. And so that's what I spoke on. It was American Nursing Informatics Association where I went and spoke. And so I told my sister, I said, okay, if I can go to this conference and speak and don't think, then I'll listen to what you got to say, right? <laughs> was like, so anyway, I went to the conference and you know I came back and she goes, okay, I want you to go to this other conference. And I was like, what conference? And so it was called the National Nurses and Business Association, the okay. NNBA. 
I had never heard of it. And I was like, how do you even know about that? You're not even a nurse. Like, where did you even find this? And are you sure I should go? But anyway, long story short, I went and I was amazed. You know, like I said, I had done legal nurse consulting. I had done a couple of things on the side, but I had no idea that nurses could do this many things. There were so many people there, so many different businesses. Um, there are a lot of coaches, but besides the coaches, there was all kind of businesses. Um, they're, you know, them starting up their own um, CPR classes, um, people doing um, like Botox, like skincare businesses. There was like so many businesses and I was just amazed. And so on the third, I think it was the third day, I was at like the coffee little, I was going to get some coffee and there were two other nurses there and they were like, Oh, you know, introducing themselves and they're like, well, what business are you going to do? And I was like, I have no clue. My sister told me to come here. That's the only reason I'm here. <laughs> and I said, but I go, but I've been thinking over these, you know, a couple of days that I've been here that I could either do something in informatics, some kind of business with nurses in informatics. And I said, or I said, I have a family member who has a serious mental illness and the I go to support group and the families are struggling so bad. Like they just like one lady, one day she was crying. I just jumped up from the table and just went and hugged her because, you know, they're scared. They don't know how to talk to the doctors. And so me being a nurse, I, I mean, I had those same feelings and those same issues, but I know how to maneuver through the system. I know how to talk to doctors. I know who to call. And, I, you know, I, I just had this extra knowledge. And so I said, you know, so I really think maybe I should try to find something to do where I can help them because it's just, you know, it, it, it's terrible. And and I told them, I said, I'm a nurse, my husband's a therapist, and even we struggle with, you know, trying sometimes trying to figure out what to do. And so, um, so anyway, I, I said that, and then the other nurse said, yeah, we're both here. We don't, we just came too. We didn't know what to expect, and they told me what they were going to do. <clears throat> and so when we were, when I was done, and we we're about to walk away. One of the nurses said, um, she said, well, I don't know what you decide to do, but I hear your passion helping those families. So maybe that's the business you should go for. And so that's that's kind of where it was born. Well, that's that's important. That's interesting because um, going to a conference for business, nurse business owners, right, and entrepreneurs, and then not knowing where you're going to land. And just being open. And I want I want our listeners to hear this because sometimes you don't have the answer. You don't have that aha moment of this is the business I was meant to start. But you uh, you went, you were open, and then someone spoke into your life and helped you to recognize what you were already passionate about. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I and I think if I had a if I had a thought about that. Um, before I went and before that conversation, I wouldn't have thought of that as a business idea. You know, it, it, it wouldn't have come across to me as a business idea. That's and why, since. No, I was going to say, that's why I have this show is because you never know someone could be listening to your story and have an idea because of what you you just said about your story and how you came up with your business. Yeah. And, you know, I think, um, so, you know, yes, I'm going to pat myself in the back. Nurses are awesome. <laughs> yes. Nurses are awesome. And, and the way, the way that we learn and how we have to learn things by algorithms and just the way we learn, it makes us great entrepreneurs. Like it, it a lot of nurses are afraid and I'm like, it's okay. If you can't do nothing else, just use the nursing process to figure out what you're trying to do, you know? We we have so much knowledge. We have, um, you know, you. I don't know if you've seen those pictures a couple of years ago that were going on Facebook, and they had rooms of ICU with all these tubes and machines. And I, I mean, if if you can do that or be on the floor and take care of like eight patients at a time, the the stuff that we have to do and the knowledge that we have to know, we can carry that anywhere. You know, we can carry that into a business. We can carry that in other areas of our life, which I think most of us do. We just we just don't know it. We just don't think about it like that. We you don't just, recognize it. Right. Right. So I hear you say recognize your genius. <laughs> yes. Yes. Recognize your genius. You know, because I, I didn't I didn't get it. I, I um, 
I mean, even I even talked to doctors and they're like, oh, my God, you work in neonatal, neonatal ICU. Oh, my gosh, you did it for that many years. Oh, my gosh, you worked in informatics. And I'm and I'm just like it, it was my job. But it's, it's uh, what, do, what, is, what do we always talk about? Imposter syndrome It's imposter syndrome. Yes. yes, we 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 have this genius and we don't even know how to tap into it. We have this genius and we don't even understand because for us, it was our job. And for most people. Um, not all nurses, but for, for the majority of nurses, we, we are nurses because we care and we have compassion and passion for helping people. And so that's all we're thinking about. You know, we're just thinking about our patients and the people that we're helping. We don't think about we can help them in other areas. We can help them outside of the hospital. We can help them outside of the clinic. We don't think about that. But we naturally do those things, right? Because right. how many times have we been at, at church or at a soccer game with their kids and someone comes up and asks you, hey, can you look at this? What do you think this is? Should I go see the doctor? We're, we're using those skills in everyday life, whether we know it or not. And we're often always analyzing and assessing. Right. I mean, I, it's I so someone funny walk, you said that. It's like, oh, I think they've got, uh, yeah, sciatica, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this, this cream would be good for that, you know? <laughs> so, um, it's funny you said that cause I did a, I did a post a couple of weeks ago. You know, have you seen all these TikTok posts where people are doing, of course I'm this because da 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 da. Right. So mm -hmm. I did one and I said, um, of course I ask a lot of questions because I'm a certified nurse coach. And, and when I did that post, what I talked about in there, one time I was talking to my boss and I was telling her, my family says I get on their nerves because I ask them too many questions. And she said, you're a nurse. Of course you ask a lot of questions. This was years ago before this meme came out. <clears throat> and I was like, what do you mean? She goes, whether we're at the bedside or not at the bedside, we are always assessing, observing, and troubleshooting. Exactly what you just said. She goes, we always are. Whether we, Even if we don't even realize we're doing it, we always are. And it's true. I could be sitting there and see somebody um, struggling, you know, at, at a meal or eating or something like that. And my first thought is, let me go help. Let me go with this. <laughs> let me go advise. And, and so I, I have to sometimes stop myself and say, okay, these people don't know you. <laughs> but if I go up there and say, I'm a nurse, is there something I can help you with? Then they'll be like, oh, yeah, help me out. You know? <laughs> We're still the most trusted profession. Yes. Here's a year. We're still the most trusted profession. We're sometimes the most abused of profession, but we're still also the most trusted of, uh, profession. And I, yeah. I love being a nurse and I can't imagine doing anything else. And I like nurses to know that you can still be a nurse, but just do it differently. My philosophy is always leave your job, don't leave your profession. Right. Absolutely. So yeah. You went from NICU nurse to informatics. I mean, that is a radical jump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a radical jump. But you're still a nurse. Right. Right. And so tell us a little bit about your business and what you do. So I am a certified nurse coach. I am at my role in my business as a mental health caregiver coach. And I know that certified nurse coach, when I talk to people, that kind of confuses people. And all, all that really means is that I'm a registered nurse who's a coach. So it's, it's kind of like being a life coach with healthcare experience. So if you hear someone say a nurse coach, that's what that means. And as a mental health caregiver coach, I help, um, just like you said in my bio, I help families who are uh, taking care of someone with a serious mental illness. And so I, um, the way that I do that, I do consulting helping them find resources. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with family members because some of them are just like lost. Um, so I do co I do coaching for that. I do coaching. I, I, I actually coach anyone who is like wants to enhance their mental or physical well-being. Um, but um, but I, mo I work mostly with those families. And, you know, they just, they struggle. They need help. It's, it's difficult. They don't know where to turn. And I just, I love when I'm coaching and I can see the, I see the transformation because usually when I'm coaching those family members, they usually like the first probably three sessions, all they're talking about is their family member. 
you know, this is going on, this is going on. I'm trying to help with this. I'm trying to get this straight out. And it's usually not until probably the fourth um, session that I that it flips. And it's kind of like 45 minutes about them and what's happening with them. And then maybe 15 minutes about their family members. And that's where I want to get them to. That's a transformation that I want them to have because, you know, so there's, there's statistics out there where there's like um, about uh, approximately 53 million caregivers in the United States. And about 8.3 million of them are caregivers of someone with a mental illness. And within that, so there's like 70% of caregivers in general who end up having their own mental illness, like anxiety or depression um, or heart attack or other illnesses just from being a caregiver, just from the stress of being a caregiver. And then within that, if you're a caregiver for someone with a serious mental illness, it increases by 10%. So there's like 25% of family caregivers of mental ill and 14% of the other caregivers. So, I mean, that's like, they need help. <laughs> They need help. We need to help them to 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 move uh, maneuver through this caregiving journey so that that does not happen. And so, go ahead. No, I was going to say it, it, it's it's it is difficult because I've seen it. Uh, I you know had family members bring in uh, their loved one, and they're and you're right. It's all about well, this is what they're going through, and this is what they need, and this is I need help. And then finally, we can get around to, especially if they are the patient, not the <laughs> person you're caring for. Um, well, what about you? Where are you? What do you need? And it, it's kind of like nurses, right? If you're the caregiver, you're constantly putting other people's needs ahead of your own. But we often forget that if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to have anything left to give. Right, right. You're, and not only are you not going to have anything left to give, but you're going to be sick yourself. Yes. And, and that's what these statistics are finding. And I mean, just being in my support groups and just the clients that I have, I, I see it. I see it firsthand. It's um, it's real. So anybody listening, if you're a caregiver or if you know someone that's a caregiver, get education, get some resources, get some support, go to support groups, get some help because it's 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 not a joke. It's real that this this you know, you, you can become sick if you don't take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just curious to see if there's uh, some correlations between illnesses such as cancer, heart disease, and things like that from people who are caregivers, uh, because I've seen it anecdotally where they've taken care of so many people, they've neglected their own health until it's too late. Mm -hmm. And they've already had something. I had another uh, lady that um, had taken care of family members. Son's got mental illness and all this going on. And I kept saying, but you need to go see the doctor because you're losing weight. You've had this uh, area on your face. She so you ended up having skin cancer. I mean, this whole other thing that progressed and she became very debilitated. And it took her a while to get back to her health because she neglected herself for so long. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you can see it when I usually when I first see the when the first when the client first comes to me, you can see it in their face. I mean, we talked a few minutes ago about how we're always obsessing and observing like it literally they're they're that you can see it in their face, the exhaustion and the the fear. You can just see it. And that and that's why I like like around that fourth time when it changed, like I literally, I get goosebumps because I can see the change. Like they logged on that one time, and, you know, and I'm like, ah, okay, okay, they're getting it, they're getting it, because it's just, um, it's critical that they get help, and so, <clears throat> so that's what I do. And then I also speak at conferences. I speak at workshops. Um, every now and then, I'll do a workshop myself, uh, and I'm hoping this year to get um, either a Facebook group. I'm, I, I'm trying to get, I want to get something that's ongoing support um, because, you know, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, but you can only help so many people when you're doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I'm trying, so this year, is, that's my goal is to get some things going to where there's like continued support. And there's, and there's lots of, um, you know, lots of organizations who support, well, I shouldn't say lots, because a lot of times when you hear about, um, businesses and coaches and caregiver caregiver coaches is usually 
people who are taking care of like the elderly or dementia. Yes. There aren't very many for specifically for caregivers of the mentally ill. And it's hard because I, like it, it's different. Like my mom has dementia. So every now and then I have to take her, like I get her for like a week so that my sister can get some respite care. And so taking care of my mom versus taking care of my family member is like, it's, it's different. Like it, you kind of have to understand what it's like to take care of someone with a serious mental illness. So, so mm -hmm. it's different. So it's, um, A lot of times when you hear about all these caregiving companies, they don't know how to help these families. Now, there are some national organizations like, like NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. They have a huge uh, family to family program, which is good. Um, so they have a peer to peer program and a family to family program. The peer to peer is for the person who has mental illness. They take this eight week course, but at the same time, they're having a family to family program for eight weeks where the family members come come, the family members and support people can go. So they help families and um, I think Mental Health America, there are some national organizations and then there are other uh, more local um, organizations that are helping families, <coughs> excuse me. And I'm fortunate to, enough to here in Riverside, we have one of the first family advocate programs, which is through the county, the county of Riverside has her own family advocate program, which is huge. Like, um, you can just call up there and be like, "I don't know what to do. <laughs> Somebody, please help me," and they'll help you. They also have a support group. Um, they have um, a resource center where your family members can go during the day. I think they even serve lunch. So, um, so that so we're really fortunate to have that here. A lot of a lot of areas don't have that. Um, which is another problem is that there are some communities that don't even have, they don't have a NAMI, they don't even have a psychiatrist. I was talking to this one lady and she had to drive to the next state to take her family member to the hospital, to the doctor appointment. And I was like, what, what is going on? But I talked to um, this doctor and he said, well, if you think about it, it's only been about the last 50 years that, that mental illness has been, um, looked at as an illness and not just a behavioral problem. And so he goes, we're, we're kind of way behind. So that's another one of my pet peeves. My other pet peeve is stigma. I talk about stigma a lot <laughs> because, you know, that's another, another problem. But, and I'm talking about sti stigma everywhere, not just people treating me different because of my family member. I'm talking about even institutionalized stigma, like politics, hospitals, mm -hmm. Even even there, there's there's mental health stigma, and so until we until we um, combat that, you know, we're going to be a little bit behind as far as getting help. What's nice is that we're talking about mental health and mental illness a lot more than we used to. Absolutely, um, yes. I remember when Simone Biles decided that she could not continue in the Olympics, and that was such a huge thing for her to talk about. And then she's coming back to gymnastics, and she's killing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And because she had to take that mental health break and she explained, you know, if my head isn't where it's supposed to be, I could get hurt. I could get injured. I could hurt someone else. It's not a good place to be. And so I think for us to be able to start talking about that and combating that stigma, I've seen it in healthcare where I don't <laughs> and I'm, I work in mental health. So I'm like, I understand that the mental health piece is very much a part of what they're experiencing, but I've also seen where so many people have been ignored because they have a mental health diagnosis. Oh, it's just your anxiety. Well, no, they're having a heart attack. <laughs> um, uh, I had a, a lady, and this is because I'm geri I work in geriatrics. Um, I had someone I sent out with an acute abdomen, and they're like, "Oh, she's just got a UTI. You know, she's just old and confused." I said, "No," I said, "She's." got abdominal pain we're treating her for the uti we're on top of the uti she's been on antibiotics for three days for this uti it's not the uti uh we ordered the the scan the ultrasound we hadn't gotten it back but she was just so bad we sent her out she had a uh, gallbladder disease mm -hmm. and the uh, er doctor sent her back to me how did and called our staff and said how dare you waste our time so of course you know i got the scan back and i just <laughs> faxed it over to her 
and made sure attention, Dr. So and so. Yeah, and yeah. it, it, it's because they think you're older, you might have dementia, you have a mental illness, that it's because of your mental illness that these things are happening. And so I often talk about that with older adults, the three Ds, delirium, depression, and dementia, and differentiating those things. And uh, I advocate for my patients, my mental health patients. I say, okay, uh, you're upset today. You just had your spouse die. Your friend died. Your dog died. You're crying. That's normal. Yes. <laughs> I want you to hear that. Grief is normal. This is yes. not your mental illness. Now, if you're still a complete mess at six months over this dog or your loved one dying, and I'm not saying you're not going to be completely over it. What I'm saying is if you can't function in life, then we're looking at your mental illness. Right. Because there's something else going on there. And so I try to normalize things as much as possible. I just tell them, you're having a normal reaction to a bad situation. Mm -hmm. This is okay. And I tell the family members that. They just lost their job. They have a right to be angry and <laughs> mad right now. Let them be angry and mad. Emotions are normal, right? So right. we talk about those things. We try to normalize things so they can, for the individual with the mental illness, they can just you know, differentiate, oh, yeah, this is just everyday life stress and everybody goes through this. No, this is, I am uh, I need some adjustment on my meds because now I can't control my emotions. I'm just crying all the time or I'm lashing out and it's totally irrational. They can recognize the difference because a lot of times they spend so much time covering up their emotions and not experiencing them. They don't know what is... Um, I hate to use the word normal, but our everyday run of the mill, I stub my toe, ow, it hurts, right? It's supposed right. to hurt. Right. And, and so um, I like the fact that we're talking more about mental health and mental illness. And so Absolutely. I thank you for what you're doing because I think it's so needed. Thank you. So how would someone get a hold of you if they wanted to utilize your services? How would they get a hold of you and set up an appointment with you? Um, I can give you a link to my discovery call if you want to put that in the notes. And then also they can, um, if they go to my website, caregivershaven.com, and it's caregivers, plural, C-A-R-E-G-I-V-E-R-S-H-A-V-E-N, caregivershaven.com, uh, 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 you'll see something that says work with me. Um, so they can find me there. You can send me a direct message on Instagram or Facebook. At Caregivers Haven. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as Sandra Boyd. So any of those places, uh, just if you if you need help or if you know someone who needs help, or if you just want more information about, about what I do, you can reach me at any of those places. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so um, I want to say this. Um, you did have your newsletter um, and there's a link to your newsletter. So those of you who want to follow her and get her newsletter, I'll also put that newsletter in the show notes as well. Yeah, so I'll get, you have the link to my newsletter and I'll also send you a link to the um, a discovery call. And and a discovery call uh, for me, for you listeners, is, is actually like getting an hour uh, free coaching. It's, it's, I do my discovery call like a coaching session. Uh, so it's like getting a free hour of coaching. So look me up, I'll put you up. <laughs> That sounds great. And so our last question is, you know, as an entrepreneur, if you had one piece of advice for a budding nurse entrepreneur, what would it be? Only one? Uh, there are so many, and there's probably more that are more important, but this one that I'm going to say, I see people, I see trip people up so much. And that is, don't believe everything you see on social media. And, and I say that because you're going to see people who are make, say they're making a million dollars and you're going to see people who have a hundred thousand followers and you're going to be working, working, working and wondering why don't I have that? But um, I've been doing this long enough to know that sometimes people, you can pay to get followers. Um, some people, maybe they are making a million dollars, but they didn't tell you it took them 10 years to get there. So sometimes 
we we will feel like, oh, how come this isn't working for me? Or, oh, I'm not doing a good job because we're, we're paying too much attention um, about other folks and what they're doing on social media. And, you know, I personally know people who, you know, things are a little bit different than what we see on social media. So um, I think I would just encourage you to not not get into that rut of thinking that you're not doing a good job because you're not doing what the other people are doing. Don't play that comparison game. Yes. Yeah, because you know what? Er everything on social media isn't real, right? I mean, yeah. fortunately for you all, you get you get what you get when you get me. <laughs> <laughs> And those who follow me, you know, I've been known to show up on my bonnet, in, in my bonnet on a on a live stream. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> yeah, you'll get it. <laughs> yeah, but I feel but, I feel bad because when people are first starting off, they they think that something's wrong with their journey, and 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 it's not. You know, no. a lot of those people have a lot of those people are you know faking it till they make it a lot of those people have been doing it for many 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 years and you know you're you're thinking oh i've been doing this for six months now and i'm not making ten thousand dollars but you know it's like some people do but but the majority don't so you just don't don't let that trip you up please yes everybody's journey is their own right mm -hmm. and I, I i look at uh influencers and I love how they're like, let's yeah, get ready with me as I pull out my Louis Vuitton and my Balenciaga. <laughs> I was a travel nurse, right? <laughs> and you know, you know, you then they show the behind the scenes where a lot of those pictures are fake and they're not really on a private jet. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so definitely, you know. If you're gonna look for something, look for the genuine and uh, people and authenticity. Yes. And if they're not willing to pull back the curtain, I'd be kind of concerned, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, this wraps up our show for today. I want to thank you for being here. This has been a great conversation. Um, for those of you that are watching us on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you know the next time that we bring in a wonderful, awesome show. Those of you that are following us on Podbean or wherever you get your podcast, please give us a comment and leave us a review. And if you are a nurse out there and you own a business and you want to come on our show, uh, hit us up at the nursesharkacademy.biz. All right, that brings the end of our show. Again, I want to thank you, Sandra, for being here. And You're very welcome. Yes, and good night to everyone. Bye. Nurses, are you ready for more? My mission is for you to own your seat at the table of nurse entrepreneurship, gaining confidence, skills, and the freedom to live your life on your own terms. Assisting you in achieving your goals through tailored advice, continuous learning, and a collaborative approach is at the heart of everything I do. Stop being eaten alive. Come feel the sun. Be a nurse shark. Thank you for listening to the Nurse Shark Academy show wherever you get your podcasts or watching us on YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you'll know when all of our episodes come out. If you want further information, you can contact us on the nurse shark academy.biz.